and we will continue to prayerfully uh, study and progress as we seek to be a blessing and to be blessed as well. So um, permit me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Arnold Ogutu, and uh, I am delighted to join you all from, uh, from the largest county in Kenya, uh, that is Marsavit. And uh, it is my prayer that uh, we shall all uh, behold wondrous things out of the word of God this week. Um, together with myself and uh, Pastor Randy Skitt, it is our sincere prayer that um, souls will be reached uh, this week and uh, the word of God will become clearer um, even as we proceed with these studies. So permit me to pray and then we shall uh, dive right into our opening message for this evening. Yes, I so let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We are so thankful, Lord, that through the possibilities of technology, Lord, we are able to study together and to break down the borders of countries and to go over lands and seas. Father, I pray that even as we study your word, Lord, we are encouraged that Revelation 10 is finding fulfillment where we have the angel with the open book with one foot in the sea and one foot on the land. Lord, and there you declare to us that the time has come when the message is to traverse and to break the borders of both the land and the sea. Father, we plead in a very special way for your Holy Spirit. And we ask, dear God, that you may have mercy upon us because we are not more worthy than those whom we are trying to study your word with. And so, Lord, we pray that in this privilege you may grant us boldness, you may grant us clarity of thought, you may also grant us brevity, that, Lord, we may respect the time of those who have taken their time to study with us. We ask that you may abide with us from the beginning to the very end. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So allow me to um, just uh, share my screen so that we can get into the presentation for today. Um, just allow me to share my screen. I apologize once again that we have not begun at the time that we had stated. However, um, this being the common teething issues um, when it's the first day, but moving forward, I trust and I hope that we shall be able to honor God through time and we shall be able to respect your time as well. Uh, kindly, um, I hope that I can be enabled to share my screen so that uh, we can begin. Uh, our subject for today, even as we wait to uh, grasp and to get a view of the presentation, is a more sure word. A more sure word. And uh, these words were spoken by one of the most popular disciples of the 12th of Jesus Christ, even those with uh, a basic knowledge of the Bible um, know about uh, the, the Apostle Peter. Um, and even in certain denominations, Peter is a very prominent um, figure. Now, the words, a more sure word from which we get our presentation for today, our study for today, is a uh, uh, these were words that were declared by, um, by the Apostle Peter. Um, and so uh, we are going to see why did he say these words and what do they mean for us in the context of the prophecies that are found in the Bible and the Bible itself. 
Um, uh, so just give me a moment to, to get the credentials to share my screen so that we can commence. Um, so, yeah, now there are many things that we know about Peter. Um, one of them is that uh, it was Peter who asked the question, how many times will someone um, wrong me and I forgive them? And Jesus gave the famous answer 70 times seven. Um, so, um, so yeah, please allow us to just uh, fix this uh, and then we can proceed. All right, kindly bear with us. Kindly bear with us as we so so yeah, as the technical team works on it, I think we will just proceed um as they sort it out now peter was uh, among the first disciples who were called by jesus christ peter was a very simple man a fisherman and um, he didn't have the literary attainments of the time but when we look at his life we are able to see uh the impact that being with jesus for three and a half years had the effects that it had on his life. Now, we know that uh, Peter was um, a very forward uh, man, always willing to give the answer to the question. Uh, through him, Jesus um, did a, a very remarkable miracle, which is when the temple authorities required Jesus to pay temple tax and Jesus performed a, a miracle. Um, Jesus performed a miracle, so we yeah, are almost here. Uh, you can just let me know in the chat by typing one, if you can see my screen for those who are joining us on the, on the platform on Zoom. Uh, you can just type one, thank you very much. God bless you. So uh, through uh, this disciple, Jesus performed um, a very re a remarkable miracle, which was really to uh, take this money that was required for as temple tax and uh, removed it. He sent Peter to get it from the mouth of a fish. Um, you can find the story in Matthew uh, 17. Now, one thing we also know about Peter was that uh, Peter promised Jesus that he would not, he would not betray. Him. We find this uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. He famously or infamously denied Jesus three times um, in line with the words that Jesus had given. We are told that then said Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will, he didn't say, he didn't even say I will not. He said, I will never be offended. Such was his self-confidence. Such was his 
belief in his own abilities and in his own uh, ability to uh, stand with Jesus, even when the going would get tough. Of course, we know how the story went. Jesus sat out, outside, Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you are saying. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And at that moment, Peter remembered the words that Jesus had given him. However, in the book of Luke, we are told that Jesus had told Peter, had forewarned him that Satan has desired to have you, but I have prayed for you. And if it is true about Peter, then it is true about every single person that decides to identify with Jesus. What do you say? And for all of us, in those moments, we can find ourselves letting down our Lord so deeply. You have decided to follow Jesus, and then you find yourself uh, finding the going getting tough. And in a time of crisis, you find yourself turning your back against the Lord. The beautiful thing is that no matter how far we have gone, Christ is always willing to restore us. And such was the restoration of Peter. Because we are told that Peter not only came back to Jesus, but Jesus once again commissioned him and told him, follow me. But this time, Peter having become now converted, Jesus also explained to him that the lot that was his master's will be his as well. He told him in John chapter 21, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you guarded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will guard you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he should glorify God. Here we find Jesus not only restoring Peter as a disciple, but telling him, in no uncertain terms, you are going to die for me. You are going to die for me, and this is how you're going to die. People will carry you. You will not be able to carry yourselves. And this has been understood by many to be the manner in which Peter died. Now, in a wonderful book written by a historian called John Fox, there he details the martyrdoms of Christians in all ages. And this celebrated English historian said that among many other saints, the blessed apostle Peter was condemned to death and crucified as some do right at Rome. Albeit some others, and not without cause, do doubt thereof. Hegesippus said that Nero sought murder against Peter to put him to death, when with which, when the people perceived, they entreated Peter with much ado that he would fly the city. Peter, through their importunity, at length persuaded, prepared himself to avoid. But coming to the gate, so Peter was escaping persecution. And as he decided to run away, when he came to the gate, it is recorded that he saw the Lord Christ come to him, to whom he, worshipping, said, Lord, whither dost thou go? To whom he answered and said, I am come again to be crucified. By this, Peter, perceiving his suffering to be understood, returned into the city. Can you imagine? Jesus appeared to Peter, and Peter, with a heart that was aglow with the love of Jesus, was willing to die for his master. He went back whence he had come from. Jerome said that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, he himself so requiring because he, he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified after the same form and manner as the Lord was. Brothers and sisters, it is a mystery. And a mystery, it is called the mystery of godliness of which we desire to look into this week. This week we desire to answer the question, how shall a man be saved? And the starting points where we meet, the contact points where we meet with Jesus, 
is in the very place where Peter has left on record saying, we have a more sure word and we are going to determine. There you can see Peter said, I am unworthy. I cannot be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. And we find him in his second epistle to, to the Christians in all ages, reminding them of the need to grow in the spiritual graces of which a lack of growth in, in, in grace was as a result of forgetfulness. And for this reason, he tells them, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. As you can see, brothers and sisters, Peter understood very clearly the passage that we read in John 21, how he was going to die, how he was going to yield up his life for the Lord. And he says, moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my disease or after my death. Now, in the Weymouth translation of the Bible, we are told in verse 16, what is it that made him so committed to the cause of his master? What is it that made him so willing to yield up his life? What inspired this commitment that led him to even say, I am not worthy to be crucified like my Lord? A man who initially had so terribly denied his Lord at when the Lord needed him. Um, so we are told, he says, for when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we were not eagerly follow, following cleverly devised legends or fables, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter tells us through inspiration that what inspired this commitment could not have been stories, could not have been legends that were cleverly devised, but what inspired this was what he saw with his very own eyes. Continuing, he says, for he received from God, speaking about Jesus, the, from God the Father, honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Brothers and sisters, this here Peter is referring to the moment when Jesus took him, John and James, and they went on to Mount Olives and there they saw Jesus transfigured. And now he not only says that the evidences of what led him to walk with Jesus was not just what he saw, but he also had. He says, and this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. You see, when you're, a, when you're a witness, you are speaking about something which you not only saw, but something that you heard as well. What is remarkable is what he says, and notice his choice of words. He says, we have also, meaning this is an addition to the evidence of what he not only saw, but heard, he says that we have also, a, and then he uses an adverb of degree. He says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. You see, brothers and sisters, Peter is telling us, under no uncertain terms, that what has been preserved to us and has come down to us in form of the Holy Scriptures, the prophetic message of the Holy Scriptures is more sure than what he saw and heard with his very own eyes. And that is why I have, um, I have themed our study for this evening a more sure word. Why is it more sure? And he says, where unto ye do well that ye take heed as light as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Weymouth uh, renders it in, a, in an even more interesting way. He says, 
and in the written word of prophecy, we have something more permanent. More permanent than what he saw and what he had. And he says, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dimly lighted place until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. As a people, as humanity, we have truly come from dark times. And it is arguable that we are heading into even darker times. And Peter invites us and says, it will be to our benefit to pay attention, to consider this word that he says is more permanent, this word of prophecy that he says is more permanent than what he saw and what he had. You see, I want to introduce you to an oft-repeated terminology that you will find all through the Bible. We are told by Isaiah, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So what was the law and the testimony? You find Jesus now in the New Testament speaking about the law and the prophets, the law and the prophets. For example, Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, verse 40, on these two commandments, the first one being, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And the second one, love your neighbor as yourself. He says on these two, this, the basis of these two commandments, the basis of what the law and the prophets bring to our attention, the fundamental principle is the two commandments that Jesus gave. We see again this terminology, the law and the prophets. After his resurrection, Jesus meets the disciples who are walking um, from Jerusalem to a mouse. And there he says, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets. So we know from the writings of Jesus that the law, when just to take us back, when Isaiah says the law, he is referring to the Pentateuch. He is referring to the writings of Moses. He is referring to the giving of the law. And what is interesting, why is it that the prophets, instead of saying the testimony, it says the prophets? The key lies in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Now, I forgot to mention. Um, of course, expecting that we will come back to this and explain it in more detail. One of the principles of Bible study based on Isaiah chapter 28, when you read from verse uh, 8 onwards up to verse 13, 10 to 13 in particular, we are told that how we study the Bible is we go here a little and there a little. We gather verses that have a bearing with the subject matter at hand. How we know that this verse has a bearing with the subject matter at hand is by looking at similar phrases, similar words, similar nouns, and when we gather them together, we are able to get the full picture. And that's why even when Jesus, uh, when, when Daniel was being instructed the prophecy was given to him and he was told that when knowledge will increase in the last days, people will be running to and fro, running to and fro in the scriptures with the meaning that um, people will be searching here a little and there a little. For example, at your own time, dear viewer, when you will be considering and reviewing the things that we have discussed, you'll be able to see that Jesus himself used this very same principle in Luke chapter 24. When he wanted to show his disciples that he was the one that was spoken of and that he had died according to the scriptures in fulfillment of what the law and the prophets pointed to, the Bible says that he began at Moses and all the prophets and showed them everything that pertained to himself. And that is the very same thing that we are doing here, allowing the Bible to be its own explainer.
or in other words, its own expositor. Now we are told concerning the law and the testimony or the law and the prophets, we are told that the dragon was wrought with the woman. We hope to unpack this in the coming days, but today we just want to look at what does the law and the testimony mean? And we are told that he went to make war with the remnant of a seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You can see again, it being suggested the law and the testimony or the law and the prophets. Notice look, uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, which says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thereby it follows brothers and sisters that the testimony is that which the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets to write and has come to us in prophetic declarations and prophetic predictions. I hope that you're following so far. And so when it says the law and the prophets, the, the, the law and the prophets essentially means why it is called the testimony, all the prophets that came after Moses. You know, Moses was unique as a prophet. When you look at, um, I hope I'm not uh, inundating you with too many verses. When you look at uh, Numbers chapter 12, God gave a distinction between Moses and everyone who will come after him. God says that in Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, that if there be a prophet among you, I will speak to him in a vision, I will make myself known to him in a dream. But it is not so with my servant Moses, whom I speak face to face. You know, Moses is a figure that cuts across religions. Even the Muslims recognize Moses and they recognize the Torah. And when Isaiah says to the law and to the testimony, it is a reference to the fact that every prophet who came after Moses was testifying of what Moses had written and they were tested by Moses' writings. Now, I want you to see something that we have been told about the testimony, about the prophets. Peter said that we do well to take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place. A more sure word. What is the effect of this more sure word? He says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the margin of the King James says, restoring the soul. Do you desire to be restored? Do you desire to be revived in your experience, in your walk? You are in darkness. You are in the darkness of guilt, in the darkness of addictions, in the darkness of sin. The Lord says, um, this more sure word is going to do a work of restoration that we are going to see. It says that the testimony of the Lord is sure. It is trusty, making wise the simple. That's why it says we have also a more sure word. Meaning, in Psalms, when Peter is saying sure word of prophecy or that this testimony is sure, he is simply, he is simply um, just borrowing and just expanding upon what we find in the Old Testament. And we are told, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. It is my expectation and my full belief that after this series of studies, someone will experience the rising of the day star in their hearts. Tomorrow we shall look um, in more critical detail uh, who this data is. But the question that I want us to ask today is, why is it a more sure word? Why is it a more sure word? Now, a few facts about the Bible. The Bible has 66 books, books that were written by at least 40 different authors, and it was written over a period of 1,600 years. Contains 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. In the, in the strictest sense, the Bible is a library written by starting with Moses and the patriarchs of his time, the prophets. We have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, and all these men. And in the New Testament, we have the disciples of Jesus and with Paul, 
as the most prolific contributor of the Holy Scriptures. And why is this word so sure, according to the Bible? He says in no uncertain terms, the reason this prophecy is more sure is for this reason, how it came. How did it come? It never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led them in what to write and gave them inspiration and gave them illumination. Essentially, moving to this text in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, just an expansion of the same, we are told that all scripture, all scripture, brothers and sisters, from Genesis to Revelation. Now notice, you know, an interesting fact is that when this verse was written, there was no New Testament. The New Testament had not been canonized. The scripture that these people knew was the Old Testament. How sad it is that many people have found themselves casting aside the Old Testament, where Jesus says all these things that they wrote pointed to himself. We are told that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is God breathed. And for this reason, it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you desire to receive guidance, to know what to do. The Lord invites you and he says, you know, there is no halfway house with this sure word. These people were either lunatics or this thing is true. We are going to see. But why did God need to speak through, through the prophets, through the holy men of old? When you start your journey of perusing the Bible, you will find that in a place of perfection, sin came. And with sin came separation. And you find Adam and his wife, Eve, hiding from God, running away from God. And from that very time, God had to speak to his people through those whom he gave his spirit. And these people are called prophets. A prophet literally means... God's mouthpiece, someone who speaks authoritatively for God. And in Amos 3, 7, we are given the assurance that surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And we are told that these prophets are the ones who gave us this word. As surely, as surely as anything that takes place on this earth happens, Nothing happens without the foreknowledge of God and without God. Nothing significant. Allow me to clarify. Nothing significant and nothing that has to do with the salvation of men has God left in secret. When we open this word, we are verily entering into the mind of God. That is what this word says. And so the writing of the Bible began with Moses, with obviously a few exceptions in the Bible where God wrote the Ten Commandments himself. God dictated. Apart from that, God used these prophets who handed down this information to us up to these last days. And some of the earliest manuscripts have been found, have been dated to 900 AD and through these excavations taking place in the desert, people have found portions of the scriptures, but at the present time, obviously they are uh, extant. And we are told by uh, Josh McDowell, uh, when he speaks about evidence demands a verdict, a very interesting book, he says, of all the manuscripts that have been found and collected, that have been dated back uh, to um, before the Christian era. He says that in one chapter of 166 words, there is only one word, three letters, in question after a thousand years of transmission. 
And this word does not significantly change the meaning of the message. Can you imagine how remarkable it is that God, if God gave this word, then the natural conclusion is that God preserved it. We are going to see these things in even greater detail. The Christian, his, his father says that the Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in his hand the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. You can have confidence that when you read in Luke chapter 4 that Jesus stood up to read from Isaiah you yourself are in possession of the same Bible that Jesus had. Obviously, things like chapter divisions and verses came much later, but the text itself has not undergone any significant change. And uh, this is the man who um, did this investigation, Sir Frederick Canyon. Now, one of the significant things that has confirmed to us the Bible, as we go about looking at these sure words, the hieroglyphics of Egypt. Egypt features very greatly in uh, the biblical narrative. We find that the Bible records that at a certain point in time, at a certain point in time, God's people numbering two million were in the land of Egypt. Now, this is something that many people for many centuries scoffers and people who doubted the Bible um, refused to believe this. Now, I'm sure that you've heard of a man called Napoleon and his military, about Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte, who was um, um, the French king, and he went through an expedition of trying to take control of a substantial portion of not only Europe, but Egypt. And as they were in this expedition, they, his, his general and his scientists came across, as they were excavating, they came across what is known as the, what has now been termed as the Rosetta Stone, because it was found in a town called Rosetta. Why is this, why is this stone significant? This stone is actually housed in the British Museum, as you can see. And... Uh, this Rosetta stone was written in three languages, in hieroglyphic, Egyptian, and Greek. It was, founded in 70, it was found uh, in 1799. And when it was found, people up to that point had been unable to break down and to decipher the Egyptian writings. And a man called Jean-François um, Jean Francois. Uh, Champollion, I hope that uh, I have done uh, justice to his, uh, to his name, but this is what happened. In 1822, he recognized that the monument contained the same decree in three languages. Going from Greek to Demotic and from Demotic to Hieroglyphics, Champollion could finally read the entire monument. It became the key to unlocking our understanding of hieroglyphics, ancient Egypt's first written language. This in turn led to the translation of many Egyptian texts. And guess what? In this Egyptian text, they were able to find evidence of the fact that God's people were at some point in time in Egypt. Essentially what happened is, as they examined these Egyptian writings that were written in hieroglyphics, they were able to determine that these stories, these narratives corroborated or aligned with what was recorded in the Holy Scriptures. And thereby, the Bible received confirmation through archaeology that what it said was actually true. Um, another thing that happened, I just want to move very fast as well. Some of the cities that have been recorded in the Bible have been, uh, have been excavated and have been found. Stories like um, Sodom and Gomorrah and the like. But I want to jump to what God says about his word. We are told that thy word is true from the beginning. In Isaiah chapter 45, God says, For thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, I, the Lord, speak righteousness. God invites us to 
hold him to account. He says, I do not speak lies. I speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Now, one of the cities that features prominently in the Bible is Babylon. Babylon is also popular in Rastafari culture. Hello. Uh, can you let me know if you can hear me? I'm really sorry for that. We um, can hear you. You can carry on. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Apologies. Apologies. Um, so, um, can you let me know if you can also see my screen? Thank you. Um, yes, you, so you can just type uh, one in the chat room. Thank you. Uh, let's uh, carry on. So we were talking about Babylon, one of the cities uh, that is very popular, um, uh, not only in the Bible, but also in certain cultures I referred to. And one of the most popular kings of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and his tablet was uh, retrieved, and there they found a uh, him talking about um, how he established Babylon. And this was obviously another uh, sling in the shot of the belief that the Bible can be trusted and the records that are found in the Bible align with what is history, what is held as historically accurate. Now, uh, you remember, of course, in Daniel 4 verse 30, he says, this great Babylon is the one that I built and a tablet was found housed in the British Museum that actually confirms that there was a king, a Babylonian king, whose name was Nebuchadnezzar. Someone else who is also popular, of whom we have gotten even sayings uh, that are popular in English language, such as the writing is on the wall. You know, when someone says he saw that the writing was on the wall, it means that someone is going to lose their job or something like that. This comes from the Babylonian king who was... Uh, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and we are told that 
Nebuchadnezzar, his father was called Nabonidius. And archaeology has actually found in the cylinder of Nabonidius, he mentions Bel Belshazzar, and he says, and as to Belshazzar, the exalted son, the offspring of my body. Um, of course, Belshazzar was co regent with his father at the time when Babylon was overthrown. And this um, cylinder confirms that there actually was Belshazzar and the record that is given in Daniel chapter 5 was actually true. Daniel, in fact, the book of Daniel is one of the books that has received some of the most bitterest opposition and doubts and questions. But through, obviously, archaeology, we were able to see that it is indeed true that these things are historically accurate. And for this reason, remember what Peter said, that the prophetic word more sure than what he had and saw with his own eyes. Um, just to move very rapidly, we are also told that in the, in the last days, the book of Daniel will receive greater focus. In fact, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, Daniel was a prophet in Jesus' book. And that only serves to inspire us and to invite us to also consider the same. And that is what we are going to seek to do as we try to trace how prophecy has delineated the events down to our very own time and also to where we are going. So all these cylinders and tablets and brick walls that have been found through science and archaeology have all confirmed. Now, something very interesting about prophecy, as you prepare to bring this segment to a close, is that God says that there is a certain attribute concerning him, apart from the fact that he's the creator, but also the fact that he is able to foretell the future. He says in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9, and that is essentially prophecy. Prophecy deals not only with the future, but it also delineates the past as well as the present, taking us down to the end of the age. He says, I am God and there is none like me. Why is it that there is none like him? Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Brothers and sisters, I just want to, to put in focus how significant it is. I know that we are human beings and therefore uh, we, we can't really appreciate how huge it is for someone to be able to accurately predict what will happen tomorrow or even in the next hour. This writer, John Clark Ripton says, History has yet made so slight progress toward the scientific basis that she is able to foretell nothing that, that is to be hereafter. Have you not seen people making fun that when the year is starting, they are stepping in slowly because we do not know. In January of 2020, the world was normal. Two months later, the world as we know it had become something totally different. No one had been able to predict it. Of course, we will uh, examine whether God was caught by surprise by these things. But we are told that as to the future, she is stone blind. There is not a philosopher in the world who can forecast the historical evolution to the extent of a single day. The historian is as completely dumb before the problems of 1895 as a charlatan weather prophet ought to be with respect to the meteorological conditions of the next season. You know, here in Kenya, we were told that in January, there will be a lot of rain. Of course, it rained for a couple of days, but now it has become uh, obviously as dry as the hills of Gilboa. And we are told that the year will come and go. It will fulfill its purpose in the great calendar of man life. Its events and issues will be evolved with scientific exactitude out of antecedent conditions. But no man living can predict what the aspect and event will be. The tallest son of the morning can neither tell, can neither foretell nor foresee the future of what is to come in the year that already stands knocking at the door. But Jesus, brothers and sisters, removes that veil through his holy word, through this more sure word, and confidently predicts what is coming. For example, 
One of the predictions that happened in the time of the prophet Isaiah was about the fall of Babylon. And I want you to notice what prophet Isaiah almost a hundred years, over a hundred years before, prophesied about Babylon. He said, and Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And he even predicted the nation that was going to overthrow Babylon. And this is a matter of historical fact, my brother and my sister. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his device is against Babylon to destroy it. And to the T, to the T, this prophecy met its fulfillment when King Cyrus invaded Babylon through um, creating an artificial dam along river Euphrates and thereby entering through the walls of Babylon and overthrowing, um, overthrowing Babylon. And the Bible even predicted the state under which Babylon would be on the very night when King Cyrus would come. Now, notice King Cyrus is being spoken of here almost a hundred years before his birth, even up to and including his name. He says, thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, I will open before him the two leaf gates. Historically, Belshazzar was caught up in revelry and feasting and they left their doors open. You can confirm this as a historical fact. And concerning the conquest of King Cyrus, who is spoken of in the Bible, when you go to the British Museum, you find the Cyrus Cylinder. And in the Cyrus Cylinder, it depicts and records his conquests, his overthrow of Babylon, and also the restoration of the Jews back to their land after the Babylonian cap captivity. A more sure word, brothers and sisters. One other thing that Isaiah said is that Babylon would never be inhabited. But who would inhabit it? The wild beasts of the desert shall lie there and owls shall dwell there. And in a book called Discoveries Among the Ruins of Nineveh and Babylon, as they went to, uh, to, uh, to do the, their archaeological studies and findings, this is what is recorded. Shapeless heaps of rubbish cover for many an acre the face of the land and naked and hideous waste. Owls start from the scanty thickets and the foul jackal skulks through the pharaohs. When you go to the place that was Babylon, it's some place in Iraq, a particular uh, spot in Iraq, uh, where Iraq is today, to this very day, the word of God has stood just as Isaiah declared it. The grass withereth, the flower faded, but the word of our God shall stand forever. When God says a place shall not be inhabited, it shall not be inhabited. And by the same token, when God says this is what you can do to inherit eternal life, you can best believe that this is more sure than any hearsay that you can ever get, even from the disciple himself. Remember the, uh, the disciple Peter declared that the prophetic word is more sure than what I had with my ears and what, what I had with my ears and what I saw with my own eyes. Another thing that Jesus prophesied about the city was um, the fall of Jerusalem. In Matthew 24, Jesus spoke about the fall of Jerusalem after his crucifixion. And in 70 AD, less than a generation after the resurrection of Jesus and his consequent ascension, Jerusalem was destroyed. And brothers and sisters, the main point of the prophetic word and why it is so sure is this. Jesus declared, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Prophecy is not the be all and all about the Bible, brothers and sisters. The prophetic word is there for a purpose. It is to lead us to him who is able to give us eternal life. He who has availed eternal life for every son and daughter of Adam. And 
Remember, Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter said, um, Peter said, Where unto ye do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. This is not talking about the second coming. This is talking about a soul that has been in the darkness of sin and guilt and shame. When we consider the prophetic word, it gives us confidence that Jesus is true and that the eternal life that he has promised for all of us is available. And that is basically what we are going to be doing. When Jesus himself physically being alive, Jesus did not tell his disciples, trust what I'm telling you. He turned them back to the Holy Scriptures as evidence. He told them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Dear viewer, dear listener, my desire and my appeal to you is that we do not shun anymore the Old Testament or the New because they are all leading us to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, the revelation, the last book of the Bible, is known as the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not so much about the beasts and the other scary symbolisms that people uh, find scary, but it is a revealing of this man, Christ Jesus, and why he is so attractive and why he wants to be a friend to every single one of us. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It is truth that sets us free, brothers and sisters, free from addictions, free from hatred, free from strife, free from sin, free from guilt, and free freedom from every negative thing that evil has brought into our world. And you know, Jesus also said, thy word is true. The more sure word, brothers and sisters. Let me end by giving you a very fascinating thing that happened in, um, in a certain island called Pitcairn. And Pitcairn Island, uh, one of the most dramatic examples of the effect of the Bible happened on the island of Pitcairn. One man found a Bible in the bottom of a ship trunk and, starting, and started to read it. As he read, the power of God's word reaching into his hardened heart, changed his life forever. The peace and love that man found in the Bible entirely replaced the old life of quarreling and liquor. In this island, he began to teach every person. He began to teach the children from the Bible until every person on the island had experienced the same amazing change that he had found. When he found the truth in the Bible, he couldn't keep it to himself. He shared with everyone on the island, and today, with a population of slightly less than 100, nearly every person on Pitcairn Island is a Christian. Remember, we are told the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The reason Peter also said a more sure word is the effect that this word had had on his own life. The greatest testimony that can be given is that I was lost, but now I'm found. The changed lives of people, countless people, including myself, who have given the sure word a chance. When you have experienced something, you know, the Greek word used there for sure is something firm, something that you are standing on. And that's why we are told, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. My invitation to us is to build on this sure, trusty word this week. And we shall find rest for our souls. This changed life is available for every one of us. Every single one of us 
Christ is inviting us to consider this sure word. I want to pray with someone um, who has been uh, convicted and wants to study the word of God, wants to consider it once more, but you do not know where to start. Um, in our chat, and I believe that also in the uh, in our chat and also in our in our platforms, um, there will be a, a Google form that will be available for you to fill. If you feel that you want to respond to this call, um, I invite you to fill that form as well. But permit me to pray um, as we bring this to a close. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before your presence. We thank you so much for this sure word. Um, and Lord, I thank you for preserving it down through the ages to our very own time. As we seek to consider it, we pray that your Holy Spirit who inspired it may enter into every heart and that we may truly testify with the psalmist that the law of God is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. May this be our testimony in Jesus' name. Amen.